Hi there, welcome once again. I'm Imran Garta and you're in the stream. Today, merging man and machine. How far could scientists go in re-engineering human evolution? We'll discuss the ethics of transhumanism. Our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is here as always, looking out for all your live feedback. You can tweet her your comments and questions with the hashtag AJStream. Hi, Malika. Hey, Imran. Well, joining her on the couch is Ari N. Shulman, senior editor at The New Atlantis, which is a journal which covers the intersection of science and society. Also the co-author of the blog Futurisms. Ari, welcome. We're looking forward to uh, your opinion Thank on you. this fascinating subject. Looking Thanks forward for to having hear me. Yep, great to have you on the show. Looking forward to learning from you as well. Now today's show was suggested to us via Facebook from Zed Shamim in London. Now, if you want to suggest a future topic for the stream, just go to mm. facebook.com forward slash AJStream and then just like us. Hi, I'm Alexander Young, founder and CEO of SoundCloud. We're unmuting the web and I'm in the stream. Now, a cyborg future. That's what proponents of the movement known as transhumanism are envisioning. And if you look at today's biotech advancements, one might think we're not that far off. From bionic arms and hearing implants for the deaf, to Botox and drugs that improve our concentration every day, we're hearing about new types of enhancements. But could they ever go too far and even transcend what we've defined as being human? What ethical implications could society face in creating humanity version 2.0? Well, here to help us understand these issues is uh, George Dvorsky. He's a bioethicist, futurist, and chairman for the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies. He also blogs on the website Sentient Developments and is joining us via Skype from Toronto. And uh, also with us via Skype is Robin Hansen. He's an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and a research associate at the Future of Humanities Institute at Oxford University. And he's joining us from Hawaii in the U.S. Robin and George, welcome to the stream. George, I want to start with you. Let's get first things first. What is transhumanism? Help us with a definition. Sure. Transhumanism is a, it's a philosophical, it's a cultural idea. It basically suggests that we can and should use our technologies to improve the human condition. We've kind of come to the realization that uh, evolutionary biology and Darwinian processes have only gotten us so far. And it really has kind of come to a grinding halt. And now it's really up to ourselves, the human species, up, up to intelligence to take us forward to the next stage in our development. And really what it is as well, it's largely a continuation of our medical sciences. This is really nothing new. It's, it's just that the, the degree to which the changes are now going to happen is certainly an order of magnitude greater than they have been in the past. But really the human species is defined as the species that has taken itself out, if you will, of the, the Darwinian paradigm and started to forge its own future. So more radically speaking, or even more uh, practically speaking, what that means is such things as the application of genomics and genetic technologies. It can be such things as cybernetics, so everything from uh, prosthetic limbs through to internal organs and so on. It can even mean such things as changing the way our bodies look, the way our bodies function. And most importantly, I think, it also change, we can change the ways in which our mind works to make us perhaps smarter, to give us perhaps a, a greater capacity for memory, even to be able to control our mood and to get rid of some of those, those uh, nasty bugs that are part of uh, 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 human failings, if you will, in terms of how, uh, how far Darwinian process has got us. Oh, okay. So like I said, go ahead. Okay, I wanna bring Robin in. Robin, what George said sounds very exciting, but is transhumanism inherently positive or is it neutral? Can it be used for good or bad? Well, changes can be used for many purposes, of course. Uh, the, the transhuman mus movement, as George indicates, tends to be uh, advocates uh, po thinking of it as positive and, and hoping for it. There are others who are expressing more concerns, even opposition. Uh, I think it's great that we're starting to think about all these possibilities. It, it's obvious that over the long run, uh, there'll be a lot more possibilities for how we and our descendants can change. I think it's somewhat premature to either advocate for or oppose uh, these changes because we don't actually know very much about the context in which they'll appear. Eri, premature? I mean, there's so much that we're yet to learn about this, but is it perhaps good that we're having this conversation now to figure out whether we like it or not? Uh, yeah, absolutely it is. I mean, better to talk about this before we just sort of plunge in. Uh, Robin mm -hmm. is right that it, a lot of it depends on what happens. and. One of the interesting things with transhumanism is it's kind of uh, whatever people want it to be to different people. It's, it's sort of a grab bag of different things. But there are, there are a few aspects of it that are common to all transhumanists. You heard George talking about how this is 
no different from what we're already doing, uh, that this is just the same as medical technology. But then he kind of went on to describe all the ways that it is actually very different. Uh, tinkering with the genome, uh, giving ourselves drugs to change our, our moods and our personalities, uh, uploading ourselves onto the internet. This is another big popular mm -hmm. idea among transhumanists. Uh, I think that these are, are pretty radically different. Uh, and the definition he gave of transhumanism I don't think is a very good one, uh, because the idea of using technology to improve the human condition, that is what we've been doing all along. But this is, this is a, a distinct break in using technology to actually change human nature. Uh, and that's, that's something that has very big implications. Okay, let's gauge the pulse of the community, Malika. Well, George, before you respond to that critique, I want you to listen to this tweet um, from members of our community. This is from Yolk Meme, who says, there's only so far humans can go in their quest to play God. Even with enhancements, life is life and death will be death. Um, and on the back of that, there's a tweet from Luke Shore who says, doesn't transhumanism all stem from humanity's persistent reluctance to accept the inevitable death? So how do you respond to, to claims that transhumanism is about trying to be immortal? Well, that certainly is a major component of transhumanism, this idea of radical life extension. And the idea is that uh, we're starting to get a, a very good handle on the aging process and the, uh, the biomechanical ways in which we do, in fact, age. And there are a number of models in place already that suggest, look, we can actually uh, do something about this, that uh, this is that aging can actually be looked at uh, like a disease unlike any other, and that all we have to do is get on top of the various factors and we can retard the aging process, even uh, potentially uh, halt the aging process altogether. So why that's so upsetting for so many individuals, and it's very understandable, is that this has been an absolutely inalienable part of the human condition. We live and then we die. And in fact, a, a culture is virtually uh, situated around that reality. So by upsetting the apple cart in this way, you're not quite naturally going to get a lot of negative reaction toward it. That how dare you violate the natural order of things, how dare you play God, and so on. I think what this calls for is a very serious reevaluation of this uh, assumption that we do need to look at, okay, what does it mean perhaps to live hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, and so on? What does it mean in terms of our uh, existential um, uh, type of placement in the world, our relation to others, and so on and so forth? But I think it's a very, we need to be cautious about reacting, I think, in such a knee-jerk way to the, the potentials for radical life extension. Okay, I want to bring your attention to um, a clip from a forthcoming documentary. It's called Fixed, the science slash fiction of uh, human enhancement, which explores the relationship between transhumanism and people with disabilities, perhaps the community greatest affected by these developments. We're going to hear from two, two people. The first is John Hockenberry, who's a journalist and disability rights activist who says that having human enhancements is no different from being human. Take a listen. Everything from brain implants to spinal cord injury, rehab, to cell phones to gaming, there, there is no difference between them. What if? this kind of collaboration with a machine was flexible enough to allow the user to do whatever they want with it. You want to make a device that has an, a sophisticated enough collaboration that that human will make it an arm in their own way, in their own image. I really don't understand the desire for enhancement technologies. We don't have basic health care, not only in this country, but globally. Preventable diseases are like number one killers globally. Talk about misplaced priorities. Talk about misplaced pi priorities was the last word we heard there. Robin, that debate among people with disabilities regarding transhumanism, is that a microcosm of the debates that are going to be held across the board involving everything else that transhumanism affects? I think so. I think that's fair. Uh, Ari emphasized how uh, we're facing some pretty radical change, and George emphasized how we're continuing with what we've done in the past, and I think they're both right. The fact is, in the past, we've had pretty radical change. We've already had radical life extension. We've already had radical changes to our environments and our work style and our, and our environment, the way we interact with each other. So we are facing uh, radical changes ahead. We don't have to pre-approve of all of them. We should you know, wait till see what's coming and then piece by piece in the context decide what we like. Robin says radical change. Ari, there's a tweet here from Ali Glenesk who says, who will govern access to transhumanist technology? If only the rich can access it, how will that impact evolution? So who gets to be in charge? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think that the, the question of, uh, this is a common concern among transhumanist critics, of uh, increasing income inequality, or, or that these would be powers that would mostly go to the rich, 
That's an important one. I don't know that it's the best way to think about it. A, a more uh, salient way to think about it is uh, not who would have access to it, but would these people be controlling other people, uh, the, the people who are creating these technologies and deciding how they're disseminated. Uh, and you can see why this is relevant when you look to the past history uh, of massive biotechnology programs. Uh, transhumanism really has its roots in many ways in the eugenics programs of the last century, uh, which are most uh, famously associated with uh, Nazi Germany, but they were also very prominent uh, in the United States. And this was a, a similar idea of people starting with the same premise, which is that human evolution is flawed and that we should take it into our own hands. And what they ended up doing was violating the human rights of people that they considered less desirable. There were mass programs of sterilization, in some cases even of euthanasia. Um, and that was really a case, one of the problems with that was that it was uh, a sort of centralized body deciding that other people's lives needed to be tweaked in this way. And you can, you can say that maybe that was just uh, these ideas gone wrong, but, but it's really inherent in the ideas uh, that human nature is not to be respected yeah. in some way. Yeah, you have, you have opened up a, a can of genetically enhanced worms there. Uh, yeah, let's, okay. get, let's get George's response to that, because yeah. it's true. I mean, we think of <clears throat> that film, Gattaca, for example. A, what if you can't afford, you know, the enhancements? And B, what if you want to opt out? What if you don't want the enhancements? Are we going to see a stratified society? Well, I really like the way you, you framed that question, actually, because um, I think that uh, the claim that uh, transhumanism is a kind of eugenics is actually somewhat of a gross mischaracterization. Uh, eugenics, if you remember, is a top-down imposition. It's either the state or certain groups in power that are imposing a certain will uh, it's imposing its will on the population, and it has a preconceived notion of what humans should look like, uh, what they should be like, uh, who, sh who they should reproduce with, and what their children should be like. Transhumanism is absolutely opposed to any of those ideas. In fact, it's very much a, a hands-off type of a, of a philosophy. If anything, it's, it's bottom-up, where we give the benefit of the doubt to individuals who are informed individuals in conjunction with their doctors, their fertility clinics, and so on, who will make the decisions that are right for themselves. So everything from their reproductive rights, their morphological rights, and their cognitive rights as well. So that's, I think, um, one uh, way to, that's a very important way to distinguish between uh, to, uh, what uh, was referred to as eugenics. And secondly, in terms of accessibility, again, there's a kind of a straw man argument that's kind of put forth that all transhumanisms are pie in the sky about all this sort of stuff. In fact, uh, if anything, one of the most pressing concerns amongst transhumanists is the accessibility issue. And we at the uh, Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology, this is a very important important issue for us. And for I, I, as, I as a Canadian citizen, uh, I have the benefit of universal health, health care. And right now, of course, that only pertains to those medical technologies that will make me well. But eventually, we would like to think that, tech, that the line dividing wellness and enhancement is going to be increasingly bur blurred, such that there even won't be a fair distinction between the two. So I'd like to think that accessibility will be as universal for wellness technologies as well as for enhancement technologies as those lines will become increasingly uh, gray area. Robin, are you convinced? I think George is right. Aries being a little unfair. In, in the history of all technology, we've certainly had a lot of things that have happened, and a few of them have left really bad taste in our mouth, and eugenics was one of them. But I think it's unfair to pick that as a representative example of enhancement. Eyeglasses and automobiles are just as valid examples of enhancing humans as, as any uh, genetic changes have been. Uh, and, and I also think, uh, as George said, uh, people are concerned about inequality and wealth. I'm a little less concerned in the sense that in the past, new technologies always went to rich people first uh, because they could afford it, and they helped pay for the innovation that eventually allowed everybody else to have it. Eric? Uh, yeah, well, there's a lot to pick apart there. Um, I'd like to go back to this idea that, um, that transhumanism and eugenics uh, aren't fairly compared. Um, again, it's not an accident that uh, eugenics started with the same basic premise about human nature, which is that it's flawed and we should make it better and wound up where it did. Uh, and if you want to see uh, the lessons of that, you can look at some of the things that transhumanism is advocating today. Just in the last couple of weeks, uh, there have been proposals by transhumanists to institute massive uh, programs of drugging populations in order to make them less prone to criminal behavior. Uh, that's not exactly a, a bottom-up approach. Um, and there, you can see this playing out in terms of current uh, biotechnological issues. One of the really big issues today is uh, a trend called sex selection. Uh, this is a, a good example of biotechnology that started off with very good intentions and ended up running amok. So what's happening is that um, people are able to diagnose the gender of their baby in the womb. Uh, and if the, the baby is not of a desired gender, then they end up aborting it. 
There are other ways that this can be done. It can be done at conception or even prior to conception using certain technologies. Uh, for the most part, it's being done using ultrasound. Mm -hmm. But the ethical issue is kind of the same in, in either case. And you get in these third world countries, uh, there's always one gender that they prefer, which is boys. Uh, and so what you found in third world countries is that uh, women are being, in some sense, eliminated. There are demographers who have estimated that 160 million women have been eliminated in the last couple of decades. Because of ultrasounds? Because of ultrasounds and yeah. sex selection, yeah. yeah. And this is something that uh, is alarming to people on all sides of the, the bioethical aisle. Transhumanists have been mostly silent about it. To the extent that they've talked about it, they've been mostly in favor of it. Um, and I just feel I ought to bring this up. Professor Hansen wrote about this on his blog in January. And he said, uh, this is a quote here, if male lives are more pleasant overall, it is good that we create more of them instead of female lives. Yes, supply and demand may eventually equalize the quality of males and female lives, but until then, why not have more lives that are more pleasant? Uh, so just to put that in context, if you imagine people sort of taking that attitude towards civil rights uh, issues of the past, that's, that's not exactly a prescription for uplifting people. Okay, before we get Malika to get some more community feedback, Robin, you want to come in there and respond? Um, he's right. Uh, that, that's what I said, and, and I meant it. <laughs> Uh, but we're talking about individual private choice. Uh, we, we can think about parents choosing children, uh, choosing high IQ versus low IQ children, choosing athletic versus less athletic children. I think it's uh, good if parents have the best of in interest of their children at heart and choose children that they think will have better lives. I think that goes to the center of humanity, goes to the center of being a good human, uh, wanting the best for your children. Okay, let's dive back into... Well, this is definitely a conversation that's that's uh, intriguing and scaring members of our community. This is from John Nichols. I will concede that part, part of the benefits of transhumanism is dependent upon human goodwill. That scares me a bit, he says. Um, uh, before we get to the next tweet, actually, there's a video here, a video comment from a member of our community. Um, he's also the creator of How Stuff Works. Let's have a listen. Transhumanism is the use of technology to make human beings better or to make human life better. And there are a lot of different things that fall into this category. For example, if we could develop a serum or some kind of gene therapy that would make it possible for humans to live to be 500 years old, that would be transhumanism. Or if we could come up with a bionic eye or even an electronic contact lens that would let us overlay data on the scene we're looking at, that, that would be transhumanism. But the thing I've really been interested in and written a lot about is the idea of disconnecting the human brain from the human body. So for example, if your brain was disconnected, you could reconnect it into an electronic environment with incredible realism and you'd be able to feel it, touch it, actually fully experience that environment or if you could take your brain and put it in a robotic body so that you had superhuman strength or speed or could swim underwater without a scuba tank that would be transhumanism so it's anything that a science fiction writer can dream up and it might be here a lot sooner than we think <laughs> so George can we put our, our bodies can we, we disconnect our minds uh, is that coming it very well may be coming. Uh, one of the uh, recent insights in our neurosciences is this thing that's referred to as uh, functionalism or computational functionalism, which is essentially the idea that the human brain is essentially a computer and it can be understood as much. So even though it's working with biology and working with, uh, uh, with, with brain cells, it's still doing a kind of computation. All we need to do is figure out how we can synthesize that and mirror that, let's say, in a computer. Assuming that we can do that, then there's a number of models that I've seen in place that can uh, help us actually transfer transfer a mind from, let's say, its biological base to a computer base. And that's when you have this kind of vision of uh, what's called uploading or non-corporeal existence. And that could be exactly that. It could be uh, uploading our minds into a supercomputer and living, uh, living a, a life as a, as a virtual being in a, in a virtual reality environment. It could also mean discarding our biological bodies altogether, living in cybernetic or robotic bodies. So it's a, it's an, it's a very radical vision for the future, but it's certainly one that our, our science and our physics is perhaps indicating that may actually be quite possible. Uh, in terms of the desirability of that, that's certainly up to the individual. It's certainly up to uh, future generations to figure out for themselves. Now, many of these developments find a playground uh, um, among militaries and private contractors that sell to militaries. For example, we have this Lockheed Martin HULC or Hulk human exoskeleton. It's more like Terminator and uh, not Hulk. Um, let me show you some of this, just a little video of this. It basically gives you these kind of bionic legs and uh, essentially it makes to a certain extent, it makes soldiers super soldiers, uh, if you like. Um, Ari, 
if you have two armies up against each other and they're both kind of enhanced by this sort of technology, doesn't that mean you know more carnage, more bloodshed, more firepower on both sides? It does. Uh, I don't think that's how it would actually play out. I think we all know which side would be having the technology and which wouldn't in terms of current conflicts. Uh, and you can see the ethical problems with that um, in drone wars today. Uh, it's a very tricky sort of thing to talk about because from, from one perspective, uh, it's, it's decreasing the number of casualties and it's making warfare more efficient. From another perspective, it's taking people out of the loop. Uh, you have people here outside of Washington basically controlling a video game that actually mm. kills people on the other side of the world. Uh, and however effective that may be, it's, it's worth considering what that does to us uh, morally and ethically uh, to be uh, conducting warfare in this kind of detached and impersonal way. If nothing else, if warfare is necessary, it's, it's a, the most serious thing that we can do. And we need to make sure that we treat it with respect. Okay, but let's ask Robin, because he's not going to be joining us for the post-show, the military aspect, the fact that this technology and transhumanism uh, as a part of this discussion means that you know, warfare is, is waged in a more impersonal way. Is that a good or a bad thing? I, I don't really think we're discussing this technology. I think we're discussing technology in general. So on the average, overall, technology tends to be good. That, had has so far and probably will be in the future. But there are particular areas of technology where there are, we have less reason to, to be enthusiastic, and military technology is certainly one of those. We have less reason to be encouraged or enthusiastic about advances in military technology than most other areas. So that'll be true whether it's technology for uh, computers or uh, explosives or whatever else it is. Uh, but I think we should look in a detailed, context-dependent way at, at particular technologies we're going to be concerned about. So just because, in general, we don't like military technology that much doesn't mean that we should ban each and everything that might be a military technology. OK. OK. <laughs> Fairly put. Thank you, George, Robin, and uh, Ari. George and uh, Ari will stay on for the post-show, where we'll return to our discussion on transhumanism uh, online on stream.aljazeera.com. First, here's uh, Malika with a look at some of the story leads that we're following here at the stream. Hundreds of online activists are buzzing about the hashtag MPJD out of Mexico. It stands for the Movement for Peace, Justice and Dignity. Activists are using the term to mark one year of protests against the government's war on drugs. Today is not a day of celebration for the movement. We take to the streets to scream what the throats of many will never be able to tweet national emergency. Ahlam S follows. Let us not forget the 60,000 deaths, 20,000 disappearances, and over 100,000 displaced since 2006. Our next leads out of the Philippines, where an internet meme poking fun at President Noy Noy Aquino has gone viral. It's called Noy Noying, a play on the president's name. Critics are using various images to mimic Aquino's inaction over rising prices of oil, among other issues. Blogger Carlo Mangaya reports on the trend for Global Voices, linking to digitally altered images circulating online, showing the president at work in unlikely situations. And our last leads out of the UK, where student Liam Stacey has been charged with inciting racial violence over a tweet. Liam Stacey jailed for 56 days for comments made on Twitter about Bolton midfielder Fabrice Mwamba. Good job, tweets Alan Sugar. Well, Stacey allegedly began with a tweet mocking Mwamba just moments after the footballer collapsed due to an injury on the field. His account has since been deleted, and this screen grab can be seen on Storyful's page. Tell us what you think of those stories. Go to stream.aljazeera.com slash leads and vote them up or down. Imran? Yes, thanks for that, uh, Malika. I'm continuing to follow the hashtag AJStream, where you can continue to be a part of the conversation regarding transhumanism. That will happen on the post show which is next at stream.aljazeera.com. On Thursday, we'll look at Tunisia's decision to keep religion or Sharia law out of their constitution. You can send us your comments on that. Until then, we'll see you online. Bye-bye.
Welcome back to the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. Uh, good to have you with us. Part of the conversation, we continue to talk transhumanism. Uh, the ethics of it in particular, which is something that's, that's worrying a lot of people. One of the tweets that just came through from Nicholas Slayton, who's um, a regular contributor, saying, transhumanism is inevitable. It will happen no matter what. The question is, how can it be done ethically and without mass conflict? Uh, that from Nicholas Slayton. Uh, George, I'm going to throw that to you, and I'm also going to throw to you uh, this other thing that is deemed inevitable, the concept of the singularity. Many scientists talk about it, many transhumanists talk about it. This idea, if you look at you know, the Terminator example, it's the day that Skynet becomes self-aware, the day that computers develop their own brains and they become conscious. Is that inevitable, along with the different changes and evolution of transhumanism? Uh, yeah, the singularity, that's certainly a uh, uh, contentious issue amongst uh, the futurist community in terms of not necessarily is it going to happen, but what actually do we mean by the singularity? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at, a mo at the most fundamental level, it does imply the, the existence, the, the coming of art not just artificial intelligence, but greater than human artificial intelligence. And, and why that's a particular problem and why that's a particularly important point to look at in the future is that we can't really begin to understand how we might relate to that AI and what it may actually choose to do. Uh, the, the problem being is that it's not going to be, let's say, 10, 20, 30 times more powerful than, than, uh, than human minds, but that it will be an order of magnitude uh, greater in terms of its, ability, its, its, its capabilities, so millions potentially uh, of times greater. And what's particularly troubling about the idea of the singularity and the instantiation of machine minds is that we're not necessarily talking about uh, an intelligence that is self-reflective or even conscious. We're simply talking about brute calculators, expert systems that are simply amazing at doing whatever it was or is that it's programmed to do. And uh, that's what's scary is that if it was somehow misprogrammed or it misinterpreted a, a certain goal that it was given, that it could actually go about the destruction of humanity or destruction of the planet or completely it could um, destroy resources and, and so on. So it is, uh, at this, but at the same time, uh, a number of uh, supporters, if you will, of, of the singularity idea suggest that it actually could herald um, um, a rather remarkable era uh, of, of uh, human well-being or post-human well-being. So, and, the, and just want to end on this note, uh, the reason why it is even called a singularity is it's borrowed from the cosmological concept of the, the black hole singularity, simply meaning that it is simply the point in the future that we cannot look beyond. We do not know. We do not understand, and we cannot comprehend what will happen after machine intelligence comes into being. There's something, Ari, that uh, immediately strikes me with a lot of the language, it's almost quite, you know, the kind of utopian, sometimes apocalyptic language strikes me as quite religious in a kind of secular scientific way. You know, it kind of borrows these sort of religious themes of, you know, the singularity and these, these moments. A, that humanity is on this, you know, upward arc towards some sort of, you know, utopia, and then uh, click, there's an apocalypse. Um, is... Is this a riddle inside an, an enigma, inside a mystery? I mean, is this something we, we know nothing of? Or can we, can we gauge this pretty well? Uh, I don't think it's something we know nothing of. I don't think it's something that we know nearly as much as most of the people who are speculating about it do. Uh, I mean, it's striking that, that the sort of starting point of transhumanism is to say that our nature is extremely flawed, uh, that we have cognitive weaknesses and bodily weaknesses. So they, they emphasize those limitations, but at the same time have this enormous confidence in our ability to know what the future is like and in our wisdom to be able to guide that well. And one example is George was talking earlier about uh, functionalism and AI. That's, that's an idea that's been philosophically dead for decades uh, and that cognitive scientists are now really discarding as useful in understanding the mind. Uh, but there are, there are these whole pies in the sky that were built on this idea that we can uh, that we would be able to control AI in the same way that we'd be able to control our computer programs. And there's such an enormous amount writing on these, on these programs that would be effectively so powerful that they, they would be running the world. They, they seem to have the confidence that we would be able to engineer them to be what they call friendly, mm. which means either they wouldn't be able to kill us all, or maybe better yet, they would be able to, to uh, act in a way that's beneficial to us. Uh, and I just don't think that we know anything nearly enough about them to be able to ensure that. Uh, in any way. Malika? 
Well, a lot of what we're talking about today is, seems like it's the stuff of science fiction. Um, but I think, George, on, on a point that, that came up in the main show in the video comment and something that you mentioned, if we accept the fact that there could be a day when we can separate our minds and our brains from our bodies, um, there's a tweet here from Michael who says, will the human bodies be housed in vats or exterminated after brain uploads? Now, this sounds like the stuff of movies, but is that possible? What happens? There could actually be both. This is what was referred to or distinguished by what's called a hard simulation and a soft simulation. A hard simulation is the kind of thing that you would have seen in the movie The Matrix, where you had our heroes were what's called jacked in into the Matrix. So they still had their bodies in the in the so-called real world, uh, but their what happened was all of their senses were shut down and replaced by a new set of experiences, a new environment in which they thought they were dwelling in. So they could still actually have their physical corporeal being uh, in, remain intact. There is another idea that is referred to as the soft simulation, and this is the idea where we would discard our bodies altogether. There's nothing to return to, unless, of course, you could upload yourself into a robotic or a cybernetic body, that sort of a thing. But ultimately, the idea there is that you would be living in, uh, in again, a virtual reality environment permanently in a supercomputer. George, forgive me if this sounds ignorant. I'm not a biological expert, but um, given that there won't be a clear distinction between man and machine with many of these scenarios, if they do unfold, there might be a blurry line between the two and the machine aspects might augment what is already there in terms of the kind of human qualities, if you like. Does that not slow down human evolution? Because at the crux of human evolution and natural selection, there's an issue of kind of adapting and, and kind of surviving to different circumstances. Right. Doesn't that make you all pampered? And then you kind of, you know, it's devolution after that, isn't it? Surely. Um, I think what we're essentially doing is, well, first of all, I just want to just correct you in terms of uh, our, our ongoing evolution. Uh, again, evolution does take, uh, take uh, it happens over the, over the scale of hundreds of thousands of years and certainly millions of years. So in order for us to even measure evolution at a, at a generational level is pretty impossible. Moreover, because we've, some, we've somewhat uh, divorced ourselves from the natural kingdom and the selectional processes, evolution really has ground to a halt. We are really not evolving anymore. There is still some evolution in terms of sexual selection uh, and mate selection, uh, but for the most part, we're no longer adapting, if you will, to our environment through the processes of, uh, of, uh, of survival of the fittest. So this is where I think uh, intelligence needs to come in and step in and ask ourselves, okay, thanks Darwin, for getting us this far. But clearly, the, uh, and uh, uh, Ari seems to suggest that human nature is, per is perfect and the body is perfect. Uh, I seem to disagree. I mean, we are prone to so many psychological disorders, so many tendencies, so many different biases in our brain. And clearly, our, body, our bodies are extremely limited in terms of not only their capacities, but they age and uh, they get more and more uh, degraded as time uh, progresses. And that could go on and on about the different things that we could work to correct. So if anything, uh, I, don't, I don't, don't necessarily think that we're going to get soft or that we're going to uh, devolve. If anything, intelligence is taking over. It can take a strategic look uh, at pot potentially at where we need to go. And again, I don't necessarily feel that this is like the government saying that this is where we need to go. Again, that to me is uh, absolutely abhorrent. But just uh, collectively through, the, through, the, through the, uh, the course of individual decisions, through the advent of individual technologies that are, are collectively in demand, we will continue to evolve, if you will, into the, uh, into, into the future. So it's, and if anything, the human condition is anything but static right now. Harry? Harry, uh, actually, before you respond to that, I want to yeah. add another layer to, to what George was talking okay. about. And this is a tweet from Eric who says, what's the alternative if not transhumanism? Should we, should we remain at our present state or perhaps backward? And I think that ties in well with what he was saying. Sure. Um, I, I just want to clarify. I, I, I I feel like it's been made clear from my comments. I don't think uh, human nature is perfect in, in any way. We've known for a long time that we're uh, very flawed creatures. Uh, it, it's part of a, a proper understanding of that to know that uh, it is tremendous hubris to be able to think that we're smart enough to be able to do this well. Uh, and again, there's a track record uh, in biotechnology uh, over the last hundred years or so, and it's pretty bad, and it's not an accident that it's bad. Uh, as to your other question, I, I think the future should be a human one. We, we should go forward with medicine. We should keep trying to, uh, to cure disease. Um, and there are uh, a million other fronts in technology. Uh, I, for one, am very much in favor of space exploration. Uh, it's, it's really kind of surprising to me that uh, transhumanists uh, and the American public in general doesn't really support manned space exploration anymore. Uh, and I think that it makes sense for transhumanists because they don't really like humanity. They see it as as hubristic in a way for us to be traveling into space. They think that that should happen at the point that we upload our minds into computers and go off into virtual worlds that are in outer space. But 
I think we are very much at the beginning of human history, but it's human history that we should be interested in, not something besides that. I'd love to get into the space discussion, but we have run out of time because I have so much to say. We've got a warming Earth. There's so many uh, aspects to this. Yes. I, I mean, uh, we could do another show on that uh, completely. So uh, we'll save it in the bank and we'll invite you guys again Great. next time. Absolutely, but, uh, absolutely. Yeah, George, Ari, thank you very much thank for joining for us. Me. And earlier, thank Robert so Hansen as well, joining us via Skype as well. Malika, thanks for hoovering up all the tweets, video questions and everything else that uh, came through. Don't forget, on Thursday, we'll look at Tunisia's decision to keep religion or Sharia law out of their new constitution. You can join that conversation using the same hashtag, AJStream. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.